Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Cure podcast available every morning on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen. It's Wednesday, the 23rd of October here in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, soft landing signals. US bond yields haven't climbed this much after a Fed cut since the 1990s. Christine Lagarde says Donald Trump should see how hard central banking is in person. We'll bring you our exclusive interview with the ECB president. Plus, an E. coli outbreak linked to McDonald's burgers in the United States has left one person dead and dozens sick. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. Two-year yields have climbed 34 basis points since the Federal Reserve cut rates in September, a move not seen since 1995. Global bonds have been sliding this week as investors weigh the resilient US economy. Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan has urged Federal Reserve policymakers to be measured. We've got to get back in line. And so they're they're on that path. They were late to the game. They've got to make sure they don't go too hard now. And that's what they are all trying to figure out watching the data. Brian Moynihan has been speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. The Bank of America CEO added that he expects the Fed to cut rates by 50 basis points by the end of the year. The US moves have sparked a global sell-off with yields on Japan's 40-year notes hitting a 16-year high. Christine Lagarde has challenged Donald Trump's views on monetary policy makers and global trade. Speaking during an interview with Bloomberg Television, the ECB president invited the Republican nominee to the central bank's headquarters in Frankfurt. He should come and visit us. <laughs> and, you know, I have, I have thousands of hardworking uh, people Uh, economists, jurists, uh, uh, computer scientists, and I can assure you that they work super hard every day, not just once a month. The ECB's Christine Lagarde there speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. Now, the former US president told Bloomberg earlier this month that the Fed chair has, quote, the greatest job in government. You show up to the office once a month. The presidential contender contender has also pledged goods tariffs of 60% on China and as much as 20% on everyone else. Lagarde pushed back on Trump's approach, suggesting that the United States thrives during periods of trade. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has promised tax breaks on car purchases, but only for vehicles made in the United States. Speaking during a rally in North Carolina, the presidential hopeful said he wants to restore manufacturing jobs and protect the industry, criticising his opponent's track record. As your president, the American dream, we're going to bring it back. Our country is being crippled and destroyed by Kamala Harris. Donald Trump speaking there. In addition to tax breaks for car buyers, the Republican candidate has pledged to impose steep tariffs on cars and other products made in Mexico, China and elsewhere. He and his Democratic rival Kamala Harris are in a tight race across seven battleground states. Trump is leading by 1.1 percentage points, according to the Real Clear Politics average of polls. The United Auto Workers have endorsed Harris for president, but Trump has made inroads with rank and file union members, a potentially decisive voting bloc. And now to some breaking news this morning from Deutsche Bank. It has reported its third quarter earnings. In terms of fixed income sales and trading revenue, they were both a beat on the average analyst estimates. So fixed income sales and trading revenue coming in at 2.1 billion euros. The estimate had been for just a notch over uh, 2 billion euros. In terms of net revenue, 7.5 billion euros. That's 5.2% year on year increase. Asset management revenue was up. 11% 11% investment banking revenue also up 11% year on year. So that one of the top results out this morning for Europe from Deutsche Bank. The chip designer Arm is cancelling a licence that allowed longtime partner Qualcomm to use its designs to create chips. Qualcomm sells hundreds of millions of processors annually and the move could force it to stop selling many of its products. That risks as much as $39 billion of its revenue and could disrupt the entire PC and smartphone market. Speaking before Bloomberg broke the news, Arm CEO Renee Haas was asked about the dispute. I'm not going to build an electric car. I'm not going to build a phone. I'm not going to build a data centre. So to look at the value chain relative to who builds chips, relative to whether your end business is a chip business or a product business, it's gotten a lot more grey. 
We follow what the industry is demanding, and what the industry wants to see is solutions getting to market faster, and that's what we're focused on. Uh, Qualcomm, not much I can say on that other than uh, we're headed to a trial. Uh, I think it's the third week in December. We feel very good about our case. We think our case is quite simple and straightforward. ARM CEO Rene Haas speaking there at Bloomberg's London Tech Summit. Representatives for ARM declined to comment. A Qualcomm spokesperson said the British company was trying to strong arm a longtime partner. ARM is giving the US company an eight week period to remedy the dispute. And a severe E. coli outbreak tied to McDonald's has left dozens of Americans sick and one dead. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has issued a food safety alert and says that the true number of infected is likely to be far higher. McDonald's USA President Joe Erlinger says that the company is taking swift action. The decision to do this is not one we take lightly, and it was made in close consultation with the CDC. It's important to note that the majority of states and the majority of menu items are not affected. Other beef products at McDonald's, including the cheeseburger, hamburger, Big Mac, McDouble, and the double cheeseburger, are not impacted. Analysts say that Erlinger's next actions will be critical for how investors respond. Major outbreaks can haunt restaurant chains for years, with McDonald's shares falling as much as 10% yesterday in extended trading. Now, in a moment, we'll be going to a discussion about the Fed, the shifting views on the Fed's rake path, what it means for the dollar uh, and other stories. But lots of earnings out this morning. I mentioned Deutsche Bank, um, but also later in the US, we're going to get some important figures. Tesla, analysts are projecting a slight decline in earnings per share to $2.24 for Tesla. The consensus estimate is uh, for revenue at roughly $25.3 billion. Investors are really focused focus when it comes to Tesla, which is reporting in the US after market on the gross margins, the forward looking guidance. Remember, of course, uh, Elon Musk, the CEO, uh, made that big bet on autonomous vehicles, unveiled the company's robo taxi on the 10th of October. And we'll also get Boeing plus AT&T and Coca-Cola. So lots of earnings out today. Yeah, and of course, we're parsing the latest too from the European companies as well. We mentioned the Deutsche Bank earnings uh, there a moment ago, beating on fixed income, trading a key business for the bank. So lots to watch on that front as well. Let's turn back, though, to the moves that we've seen on bond markets. Treasury yields inching higher again this morning. The global sell-off on bond markets continuing. Yields on Japan's 40-year sovereign notes have risen to the highest in 16 years as well. We've got our markets live strategy just Mary Nicola with us for more on this. So, Mary, this move that we've seen since the Fed meeting, 10-year yields up about 40 basis points. How, what's your reading of, of where we are in the sell-off now and, and what perhaps might halt us? Yeah, there's a few key factors that are precipitating the sell-off. So I would argue that first it's the resilience of the U.S. economy. Um, and then and that feeds into what's the second factor, which is the pairing back of expectations of Fed easing, obviously. And then, of course, finally, we're nearing the U.S. elections. And there are concerns over a ballooning fiscal deficit. And, of course, in the event of some sort of clean sweep that we get, that um, indication of a, of, of a larger fiscal deficit just looms large. So there's a few factors here that are coming into play, and it's likely not to abate until we see the outcome of the U.S. elections. Mm, Interesting. The Bank of America's CEO has also been speaking to Bloomberg, and he's urged caution in terms of Fed cutting. Markets see almost a 90% chance of uh, reduction in a couple of weeks' time. How likely is a pause, really, or a skip in terms of a rate cut? Yeah, I think for the the upcoming meeting, basically because the Fed signaled that they're going to cut in in November, I think that's almost a done deal in line with what the market is thinking. But a pause could gain traction, especially depending on the outcome of the elections and, of course, the data from the U.S. So a Trump presidency does bring the threat of imports. And with that comes the potential ramifications of higher inflation. Um, And it will also come down to how the labor market unfolds. So I would say the trajectory is still unclear, but probably skewed more towards a wait and see approach rather than consecutive cuts in line with what the market was original thinking, uh, originally thinking. Because at the end of the day, um, the Fed is still data dependent. 
Mary, how does the, all of this rethinking about the Fed affecting markets elsewhere in the world as well? We mentioned the, the Japanese yields um, rising to, to the highest in 16 years on the 40-year. On the how are we seeing this story play out across markets elsewhere? Yeah, we've seen a rapid sell-off in bonds globally. So it hasn't been specific to the U.S., but it's basically, you know, when the U.S. sneezes, everyone catches a cold, and that's really coming through in the bond markets. And of course, because of that and the rise in yields, we're seeing a strong bid for the dollar, and that is also weighing on emerging markets and emerging market currencies. So bond volatility is high, which poses a threat to bonds and affects just more broadly. And I think you're going to continue to see that that the U.S. dollar shining a little bit brighter as that resumes. Yeah, Christine Lagarde has been speaking to Bloomberg in Washington on the sidelines of the IMF and World Bank annual meetings. She seemed confident about the direction of travel on European rates. What did you take away from her comments? Yeah, I think the ECB's challenges are very different than the Fed at this point. For ECB, it's very much about growth, and that is slowing markedly and becoming an increasing concern. And uh, at the same time, the upside is that inflation is decline, declining, so it's offering them some comfort to reshift their focus on growth. We've already seen it with some of their more hawkish members, um, Isabel Schnabel, and she's repeatedly made that shift in some of her recent comments. So, yes, yeah, services CPI may be sticky, but the slowdown in growth is obviously going to lead to some further declines in, infl- in inflation. So they're now focused more on growth than anything else. And, of course, we've seen Germany's disappointing data. That's a concern for them. And then, of course, with China's economy still far from a real turnaround that could support the global economy, it's, it's really the onus will be on the ECB and their policy and the need to do more to just help stabilise growth uh, in the Eurozone. Okay, Mary Nicola, our Markets Live strategist, thank you very much. Now to the Middle East, where Israel's Prime Minister and the US Secretary of State have agreed that the killing of the Hamas leader opens new possibilities for ending the conflict in the Gaza Strip. But they gave no indication of an agreement for what happens next. Our Middle East breaking news editor Dana Kresh joins us for more. Good morning, Dana. In terms of what has emerged from this meeting, in what is, of course, you know, the last few weeks of the Biden administration, what has emerged? So it seems there are no signs of clear progress here from what Blinken wants to achieve um, with his 11th trip to the region, right? He started in Israel and met with um, Netanyahu for about uh, you know, an hour and a half. And they concluded that the killing of Yahya Sinwar would open the door or potentially possibilities for the end to the conflict. But they stopped short of saying what that would look like. And that's the sticking point. Um, I think U.S. is trying to push for a ceasefire to at least start talking about a post-war period the day after in Gaza, um, before the U.S. election. Um, They want this kind of a win, a diplomatic win for themselves. But that is, of course, proving difficult as it has in the past. Uh, Blinken said they want to see a unified Gaza and the West Bank governed by the Palestinian Authority. And we know how Israel feels about that. They don't trust the Palestinian Authority. But at the same time, Israel hasn't really given an alternative to that. Um, So it seems there isn't really a plan, though they said they discussed in much detail about um, post-war Gaza and what that would look like, but doubt that there is any progress toward that. Okay. In in Lebanon, meanwhile, Donna, Israel has confirmed that it killed a likely successor to the leader of Hezbollah, but there's no sign of the violence abating there. Yes. So we saw yesterday um, the uh, Israel army is confirming that they killed the likely successor of, of Hassan Nasrallah, though they said that last week that he was apparently dead. Now, Hezbollah hasn't really confirmed or denied that. They're being very quiet about um, the killing of their, you know, expected uh, expected leader. And no, the violence hasn't abated. And we saw Netanyahu yesterday also saying that they would continue um, hitting Hezbollah in Lebanon until um, the residents of the northern Israeli towns can go back um, and ensure they sit their safety and they want Hezbollah to withdraw from the area. Um, we saw Amos Hochstein, the uh, Biden envoy in Lebanon yesterday, trying to also reach a ceasefire agreement to at least um, get Hezbollah and Israel indirectly, of course, to agree on certain terms, especially that UN Security Council Resolution 1701 um, and how and what it would look like um, for you know, the, the southern Lebanon, how it would look like um, under that 
uh, Security Council resolution, more army soldiers, Lebanese army soldiers, more UN peacekeepers, um, and of course, no sign of Hezbollah. That's what Israel ultimately wants. Briefly, the FBI is investigating the leak of classified documents that detailed Israeli preparations to retaliate against Iran, something that the world is still expecting. What more can you tell us? Right. So we saw the leaked documents on Telegram last week. They uh, report Israel conducting covert drone activity and preparing munitions like long-range air-launched ballistic missiles. This is, of course, embarrassing for the U.S. because this is another uh, classified leak. And, of course, we saw the FBI investigating it and, and saying that the U.S. US President Biden is also following up on this investigation. This is also a bit awkward for, um, for the U.S. because it shows that it is routinely spying on its own allies, including Israel, and is trying to convince Israel not to attack you. Uh, oil or nuclear facilities uh, in Israel. So it could raise tensions between these two allies, um, as we've seen in the past, over uh, over Israel's response to Iran's attack on October 1st. Okay, Dana Kreish, thank you very much for joining us. Let's bring you one of our top interviews this morning. The ECB President Christine Lagarde has told Bloomberg that the central bank will remain cautious and not jump to conclusions when it comes to cutting interest rates for Europe. She also defended the work of monetary policymakers after recent criticism from Donald Trump. Lagarde has been speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Frosty Lacqua in Washington. And at the moment, we are not totally unhappy with what we see because it looks very much that uh, inflation uh, is on the right track of disinflation. You know, we, we come from very high numbers, as high on, on average for the whole of the euro area as 10.6%. And the latest reading we had in, for the inflation in September was 1.7. So, you know, those, those numbers are, are relatively reassuring. They are only a number, and we're not looking at one data point, as I have said repeatedly. Uh, we're looking at a lot of data to make sure that uh, this disinflationary process continues to be, uh, to be well on track. But, you know, we also have to be cautious. And, uh, and you know, we, we cannot jump to conclusion that, OK, don't deal. We've broken the neck of inflation, no. And, uh, and I think caution leads us to look at all the data that are coming in, uh, whichever form it takes, whether it's survey indicators, as we had a lot of that in, in September, or whether they are uh, more uh, model um, derivated as, as when we have projection exercises. And we will be looking at that and continue to be uh, data dependent, but of course, cautious and not jumping to conclusions. So when you look at inflation, could it actually, could you achieve your target a little bit earlier than expected? That would be my hope. You know, if uh, our, our target is 2% medium term, and, uh, and I'm absolutely confident that we will reach that target sustainably in the course of 2025. Is it going to be early in 2025? Is it going to be very late in 2025? I think it really will, will be uh, determined by, by data, by the state of the economy, by energy prices, by the transmission. You know, we look at three components. We look essentially at inflation outlook. We look at underlying inflation. We look at transmission of our monetary policy. And and on the basis of that sort of uh, three uh, pillar analysis, we uh, we we can assess whether we are, we are definitely on track and and when. Do you think it's a little bit sooner? I mean, I, so we of course at Bloomberg look at every single word. Yeah. No, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> So I'll be quiet now. <laughs> First quarter, second quarter, or is it just too soon to, to say? I think it's too soon to say because I wouldn't be loyal to our principle of data dependency if I was to tell you it's going to be on such time uh, in the course of 25. Um, I think we all, um, governors of the governing council, and I'm sure you will be hearing lots of them in the next few days because they will be on, on air uh, very much. Uh, I think we are all confident that 25 is the year when we reach our target. So we recently had an interview with a U.S. presidential candidate who said tariffs was his favorite word. Mm-hmm. I imagine because of also your background, former IMF, former trade minister, this is not your favorite word. What is your favorite word? I think fair trade is, 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 is a key boost for growth, for employment, for innovation, for productivity. And I would say that... Uh, 
it's uh, it's it's something that we should not throw away because in any period of time where this country the united states has thrived were periods of trade not periods of i'm going to retire behind my boundaries and and play at home no do you worry about central banks being political or being dragged into the the political sphere no because i think there is a huge resistance to that in the decisions that we make despite what is being suspected here or there in any you know place uh, in the world and i think for those central banks which have the privilege of independence either by virtue of the treaties or the tradition it's critically important to hang on to it and to and to defend it because the credibility of an institution like a central bank really is a factor of how independent it is vis-a-vis -vis the politics um, and and it's precious it's a very precious but do you think that, that you'll come under attack more not you personally but just central banks donald trump said yes, you yes, know jay yes. powell no, had the look. easiest job because it's a flip of a coin every 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 month he should come and visit us <laughs> <laughs> and you know i have i have thousands of hard working uh, people uh, economists, jurists, uh, uh, computer scientists, and I can assure you that they work super hard every day, not just once a month. Um, and, and, and they are extremely conscientious and, and determined to really do the best job they can to deliver uh, the right monetary policy and secure what is our common good, which is our currency. So we defend the euro and we fight for the euro, just as the Fed defends the dollar it's for the dollar, I'm sure. I don't want to speak for Jay Powell, but I'm sure that's how he sees his job. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.